information seems to be associated with, as far as I can tell, low molecular weight volatile oil that has the ability to penetrate normal tissue cells and inhibit the virus replication and eventually eliminate the virus and eliminate the genomes that, that are hiding, the virus genomes that are hiding throughout the system. That's why I recommend using it for a year before you, or basically a year before you discontinue it on real chronic patients that have it for more than two years. Ever consider sending any uh, big box of that to Wagner? Yeah, well, I, am, I have uh, sent that. They yeah. are, uh, yeah. And he's looking at it? Well, they're doing, they're just starting a study on virals over there that started in February, and I had asked them to include donation as one of their screens. And I sent them the material. And Bowers, uh, who's his right hand man, is a good friend of mine. And uh, so I hope that's great. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I think it's a little good. Who is it? Wagner is this person who wrote the book? Wagner wrote that book on the economic medicinal. Wagner's no, yeah. probably the most well-known researcher. He wrote that TLC book too. That's all his plates and all the analysis. That. That's in Munich, Germany, and where they do uh, medicinal plant research very thoroughly. And also, you know, they're generally <coughs> funded by <coughs> drug companies because they're using herbs, but they're looking for ap applications. Like they take the polysaccharides from echinacea and in tissue culture them to grow the specific polysaccharide that they want that will later be developed into a drug. So they, they try to tissue culture certain certain aspects. One side of the leaf has got the exact structure of the polysaccharide they're looking for. The other side of the leaf has a very different polysaccharide. <coughs> it's okay, but it's not as exactly what it is. So a little more technical. Hypericum St. John's word. I showed you that picture the other day, and I mentioned that, that pollen on that, that little, it was red, and it was dripping onto the petals and stuff, and you saw that. If you're looking for, if you're looking for a good hypericum tincture, or if you look for an oil, it would be a lot more brilliant than this. This is hypericum tincture, and it's, it's red. So if you get a if you get a hypericum tincture and it's brown, then it's not probably not very good. When do you use the oil versus the other? Um, you know, well, I generally use things. the oil for external application and the tincture for internal. There's not a great deal of indications for internal use of hypericum in American literature. But um, I was talking to a lady in there in Sonoma the other day, and she told me that she she works with a Russian. Uh, doctor, and he talked to her about formula for general influenza stuff. And in that formula was hypericum. It's one of the few times I've ever seen someone use hypericum orally for, as a general application. It seems there was already originally a photosensitive reaction associated with St. John's with hypericum. That was in cattle. It really hasn't been demonstrated to any extent that I feel satisfied with in humans. So whether that exists or not, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't think it does. In homeopathy, they use it for nerve. Yep. Any injury, the spine, any injury to the spinal column, particularly, is very specific. Hypericum is indicated homeopathically as well as tincture-wise for the spinal pain. And uh, so we can use hypericum. The only problem with hypericum is the study for viruses have been done with the uh, hypericin and pseudohypericin, the uh, flavonoid components of the plant and, and the AIDS uh, Information Center there in San Francisco has a newsletter, so the lay newsletter, and they published the big thing about the use of this hypericum in, in, in AIDS. And the problem is, is that you don't want to uh, be trying to treat AIDS, I don't believe, or, or viral well, AIDS in particular with a tincture, because you're not going to get a large enough dose that would meet the dose that they've talked about in these studies at all. But I think it's a good, knowing about plants, knowing homeopathy, I think if you're at risk for or a virus, H virus or any virus, really, you might take this on a prophylactic basis, a couple of drops, two or three drops, ten drops a day, five drops a day, something like that. Take it not future then. Well, what they were using was uh, hypericin and pseudohypericin, the uh, isolated constituents of that. They were making it no, the drive. strong. The but I still think you could use a tincture <laughs> uh, and, and have some effect. I think you could use lomation and hypericum alternately. Uh, and get a pretty good antiviral effect yeah. on the distant to ward off virus. Yeah. Um, if you ever try the remission, you'll see what it means in terms of the uh, respiratory infection. The other thing that's being studied uh, for that's effective somewhat uh, antivirally is this thing here. It's castanea that I wrote up here. This is Australian chestnut. It's like the uh, chestnut roasting on the open fire. It's not like the horse chestnut, but it's poisonous. But this is the other one. Uh, so I'll just pass these around because we've got these from Australia. They're dried and they're just like little chips if you want. Right, right there. <coughs> there. Uh, uh, 
Castanea, Castanea Australialis. Oh, that's in a tincture also. Yeah, we, we sell that in a tincture form too. Both of these have uh, effects on, on the virus. The, uh, this Castanea seems to have an impairment of the glycolization of the uh, glycoprotein of the viral envelope. So it prevents the formation of the envelope around the virus, as that seems to be the mechanism that they're approaching. There's a Castanospermine. This was so this, uh, this, this information about the use of this was reported in uh, New York Times and on television and local reports about this and then, then that kind of died down. They're researching it, but and it's still going on. Still, again, hypericum's been used by the Germans for a uh, antidepressant for a long time, so the, the safety of hypericum use is pretty well documented. Antidepressant? Uh, yeah. It has herbal a, format? Yeah. Uh, you have to take it for about uh, two or three weeks, the, the hypericum. I believe, uh, yeah, I'm not good enough for this. Uh, this is probably one of the, if you, get, if you go out of here, remember to get this book at some point, because it's, it's just came out, I think Jeff's got some right here. It's an herbal medication by Weiss. This is a, a German book that's translated into English just recently. This book cost $49, $50. Uh, which is a lot for a paperback. I don't think they expected to have a large sale in the U.S. That's why it's so high. The price may drop later on. They start realizing how many books are going to sell because they probably think that we have a lot of data in this country, but we don't. This is one of the few books that I've seen that bridges the old eclectics and then the stuff that I lots of times talk about is not written anywhere, but it's put down into a form that kind of clears up some of that. Somebody's, you know, a lot of stuff I talk about comes from the German, Russian, Japanese literature because there's not that much research in English. In fact, Every American study seems to contradict every study that's done somewhere else. I don't know if they do on purpose. Or not. But they can't seem to duplicate the results very well. Does this cast may be good with herpes or because of capsule formation in this um, well I I can't remember if uh, if the study on the cast may have had anything to do with herpes if you uh, I don't think I've gotten the full study yet. I'm just kind of according to sort of kind of what uh, what I heard, I haven't seen, I've only seen abstracts of the study, which so uh, one person's worth it more and more is Jim Duke, he has several books out, <coughs> CRC Handbook and all this, he's working with it too. Uh, Does that book for Ryan Wilds? No, if you, like to collect, if you like books and have a lot of different sources, it, it's okay, but it's, it, it, I mean, he quotes a few people in there, I wouldn't be called dead books. $230. Yeah, it's, it's not cost effective at all. Yes, no. No, it wouldn't be one I'd go. Right. Right. Other things that are antiviral seem to be, uh, that's really getting a lot of interest oh, now again is shiitake mushrooms. Adotis. <laughs> 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 shiitake that grows on the logs that you can get. Tell me that again. Shiitake. Let, you know, shiitake mushrooms. Yeah, let's mess the adotis. Here's some, uh, here's some pictures I'll pass around just for your... Amusement. This is uh, all we're taking in Missouri at this farm where we're growing golden seal. There's some on the back. I kind of wrote what's happening, but there's some shiitake logs that have been impregnated and they're growing out there. And there's also some some uh, ginseng, new ginseng being wild grown yeah, instead of golden seal. Shiitake. Yeah, we freeze dry the shiitake mushroom cap. A lot of people sell the mycelium, and the mycelium is probably active too. I haven't uh, determined which is more active, but. The cap, the, the spores definitely have an effect too in the cap, so you can get a variety of rings. The, uh, <laughs> my D. Specialized hip reduction. Yeah, Gary, you got some salts up for these chips? I taste like Lincoln Lodge. Yeah, tastes like Legos. Who's eating Legos? So the uh, the two types of antiviral activities of shiitake extracts have been described as inhibition of viral replication and stimulation of host interferon production. So echinacea stimulates interferon production also. But, uh, I don't imagine that shiitake does it any more than echinacea. Do you have use it very long? No, I haven't, but the studies seem to be very good, particularly if you use an injectable form. Uh, it's called lentinum that comes from Japan, and, and they're injecting that. It seems to be pretty effective. So we have been using the powder for about three years now. You're using the mycelium. Well, the, uh, there's, a, there's a polysaccharide and it appears to inhibit the virus replication. It does not, doesn't affect the immune system. 
And there's also uh, a tumor activity, anti-tumor activity associated with the shiitake and um, interferon in host, but does not directly kill or inhibit the virus. It is interferon, but it doesn't directly uh, kill or inhibit the virus. The interferon in shiitake. Yeah. Also, yeah, you can use about 12 capsules a day, roughly, and lower cholesterol seems to be pretty consistently effective in lower cholesterol. <laughs> The other, oh, far from good. The other thing, yeah, lower this cholesterol. Just be careful with vegetarian. Do the HDL fraction. Too much. I don't know what the alkaline stuff is. Let me uh, run the. Uh, yeah. Let me run these last slides. At least they're. Lost a little bit in this tray. <laughs> TLC is Siberian ginseng. Uh, this is done, uh, you know, you can see it's not as refined as that TLC book I showed you by Wagner, and it's taken years and years to perfect this technique. This is on Siberian ginseng. All we did was to show the adulteration of Siberian ginseng. So many samples of Siberian ginseng available, and so much, so little real material available. Um, and, uh, this is a this is a few uh, microscopic cross sections of plant material that are, has, well, it's almost died, but it's coming back a little bit. We're looking at the microscope and identify plant material, so you don't just have to do it by TLC. Pharmacography is a dying art. This is Dr. Uh, one of the, it's called Balsamia. This is a, a acetylomation product that was sold during the pandemic of the influenza in 1917. That is a truckload that is going to who knows where. Um, well, this is a couple of little jokes I had. Uh, the one on the left says, uh, I'm not sure what these are, but take them for a couple of weeks and let me know how you feel. Uh, that was kind of like how Lomatia was when we first started. <laughs> and then uh, the other one is uh, how to handle Lomatia rash. The, the patient who sees all speckles look like he's got the needle. It says, I'm prescribing two coats of exterior latex. And that's the back button. I thought that was effective in treating the signs of Lomatia rash. I like that. Um, this is showing some of the uh, activity of various uh, components that uh, found in sesquiterpene. Uh, if you have a sesquiterpene, you can see that it's actually, uh, Lomation has a lot of sesquiterpene in it. C10, C15 carbon chains, uh, like sesquiterpene uh, components. So you can see antiseptic, analeptic, analgesic, anthelminic, antiarrhythmic, antibiotic. The bottom is vitamin, toxic, and so a wide range of effects associated with sesquiterpene. Um, this was a study done on uh, C10, C15 carbon chains showing its in lack of toxicity in vitro. And they did it on a number of other constituents that have the same component, not to the elevation, but by using this study, I hope that it extrapolates into elevation pretty well. There was no toxicity associated with any individual tissue cultures out of uh, kidney or intestine or so forth. Another TLC slide. They had even for reason. This is a golden seal. Some TLC is a golden seal. Okay, this is uh, one, about early 1900s. It's a uh, thing showing Clark Davis's product called uh, Trifolium Compound. Trifolium Compound is somewhat of what kind of believed to be in the Hoxie formula. So I think this is a precursor of the original Hoxie formula. Trifolium compound, trifolium is red clover. It had that in it for sure. The other constituent in it is also potassium iodide. Some doctors I've talked to say that that effect um, anti-cancer would mostly be potassium iodide. Not, not to hurt it. Quickly ash was in that compound. Yeah, yeah xanthoxin, yeah. Uh, there's about 12 things in that. This is a picture of the Lloyd extractor that uh, Yuri John and Lloyd patented that made the specific medicines. We bought this piece of equipment to make specific medicines and are working on trying to duplicate that that information. <clears throat> That's well it used to be. Uh, it costs as much as a good use of Jaguar. That's my problem. And this is just the, the patent uh, diagram of what Lloyd 
This cactus grandiflora grows and this grows in Hawaii. It's a good harbor in the ladies. Pretty useful uh, in people that do a lot of exercise, that have exercised a lot, so you can have a large heart, also called what they call smoker's heart. Uh, when you're smoking, you've got lack of good effusion from the heart. When you finish your book and it comes out, is it going to be kind of like a manual of the products and how they're used? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go a chance to look at that right. So there's the time is money. There we go. Time is money. Einstein discovers that time is money. <laughs> okay. Time matters. It also marches on. Yeah. Did you want to look at those three? Yeah. Energies? What? How much time do we have? Well, we got a time. Okay. <coughs> This is the part of the book that's probably the heart of the part of it that I hope will lead people in to say that they don't that they want to learn a little bit about herbs and they don't know what and how to start and so forth and that they can use this flow chart to get a pretty good idea of the ballpark of where to like begin. I, mean, I don't think it, I don't think that this by itself is going to make it completely clear. But a little bit of explanation helps. So this the book has got several, uh, all of the organ systems has the uh, main headings of the kidney, the liver, the respiratory tract, the GI tract, etc. And under that, there's a lot of uh, conditions that it addresses, and uh, then try to work, work with it from rather than try to explain. So if you have nephritis, for instance. And you know nothing else except <coughs> some patient walks in and says, I've gotten the fries, I had a diagnosis somewhere else, and you know this is what it is. So those are all the herbs based upon five, we use five books for this as the basic reference. We use Sherman's uh, Botanical Prescriber that I mentioned earlier. We use one of the books by Bill Mitchell, who's also another naturopath, and I have a copy of that. And we use his book. We also used uh, one called by Harper and Show. Book that's published in England that's more of a material medica looking book. And we used uh, Weiner's Herbal. Weiner's Weiner's Herbal. Well, I'm not crazy about it. We use it because it contains a lot of different information. And then there is also Priest and Priest, which is uh, another good textbook to read on more like a physio medical herbal text, which I would recommend to people. It's called Herbal. I forget the name of that right now, but but this is a good follow-up book if you want to learn about the dynamics of herbal medicine. So if you got nephritis, there's diagnosis. These are the this little range right here are the six, seven herbs that you could just generally pick off the top of your head as what might be applicable for nephritis. Lots of times in all the other textbooks that you look at, you can uh, it takes a while to thumb three pages and go back and forth. The other book that I recommend is one of the eclectic books called The uh, American Materia Medica Therapeutics and Pharmacognosy by Ellingwood. The reason I recommend that at least is because it's, this is printed in 1922. Because at least it has an index based upon diseases. And then you can go through in a list, like it says here, for to render gestation normal. It's got about <coughs> six herbs listed there. Well, that's great. Then you have to go through every page and look up you know, what it says about that to discern what the next step is. So if you look it up in here under nephritis, I don't know what they call it nephritis. Look at the fries, and you have to read about every herb in there, and then decide where to go. So this is trying to take an index like that, and then go to the next logical step based upon a more accurate diagnostic <coughs> criteria, signs and symptoms. So your that's your general category. Death, the double underline means those are your symptoms. The squiggly to squig means uh, signs. <coughs> So if it's chronic nephritis, then it narrows it down a little bit. You don't end up with those seven things. You just got three. You just got camophila, vermigium, which I never heard of, and solidago, which is. Um, what do the numbers represent? Oh, okay. The numbers represent 
how many of those texts, of the five texts, that text number one, number three, and number four, recommended that application. So we picked out, we didn't just take these things and take their word for it all the time. We used some of the information that we know from studying uh, the five medicine and the tenant medicine and kind of tried to manipulate them a little bit. It wasn't just a straight didactic TN? operation. What's that? What is T and C T? Oh, uh, toxic. I mean, there's toxicity associated with herb and uh, C C. I have to look at the. I have to look at the. I've been working on the book for three years and I've lost track of what all these things mean. I haven't had a chance to even read the book. I'm spending more time proofreading it in parts, but. Uh, it's not important right now what it means. I could look it up for you. The main thing I want to do is just give you a general idea of what this, how this works. Um, I forgot what C means. Contraindications? Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so, I got that thing right there. But, so if you got chronic, yeah, the T means toxic, and the C is probably contraindications. So it's chronic, and then uh, also if there's a symptom of just backache or some sipient, then you've got some other different things. If, the, if there's a signs of a fever associated with nephritis, then it, it differs. Now, two, yeah. if, you got, if you got more familiar with the herbs and knew what the constituents were and what the mechanism was and how that affected the one organ system and therefore relieved the stress on another organ system, you could probably explain all these things and for one reason or the other as to why they're chosen, but this is sort of an empirical system that comes out to trying to leave you with a reasonable <coughs> ballpark place to look at it and forget why. Just try to just try to use it that way. And then if you wanted to read more about that herb, then look it up in a single book like the King's Suspense Tour or Weiss might have some information in it or that, but at least it will make it faster for you to get down to somewhat of the practical uses of it. And uh, you can even probably use these on your machines if you once you kind of came up with something, an herb to use, and, it, and you know the general condition, like it might be a kidney condition or something like that, and you came up with one condition, you could probably look on there and see where that herb came out and then say, well, let's, let's do a diagnostic technique and see if it comes out with, uh, uh, you know, gram-negative uh, E. coli, that, because that showed up on the machine. And so what you want to be proving is that the empirical applications of a lot of these plants come up with something that's reasonably consistent with what you test on the machine. And, uh, it doesn't include all the herbs, of course, and it's only because it only took these five herbs. And there's lots of new information that are in studies that talk about the things as, you know, uh, the ginger and uh, motion sickness. That wasn't included in here. We hope that later on, this is in a binder format. It's a ring binder we can open it up. So as we get a little more sophisticated with the use of this textbook, we can you know, include uh, new pages or updated pages in there to include maybe more studies that might be significant. Like saliva's on in here, and ginkgo, and other herbs like that. And this is so if you uh, if you had to, if you were a student of naturopathic medicine and you got into nephritis, what you come out with? What I'd say you need to know for urinary inflammation. There's generally about five good herbs, and they they show up here a lot: camophila, horsetail. Juniper are the three that I used a lot for urinary tract problems, and, uh, and and so that's ones that are real common. I think well, juniper is used three times there. Got three indications. Tomato has got three. Horse has got two. So that, that typically figures. The ones that tend to be the ones that tend to be effective tend to be the ones that appear more often than this because they've just been used that much. In that literature that I passed around, uh, there's one thing that we call a, um, I was putting out called reprints. And they were just like, uh, it's about six pages. It talks about the uses of uh, urinary herbs for specific conditions. And uh, <coughs> there's this thing. <coughs> so if you want to get more specific of how to use it, you can you can go, you can refer to that little handout on urinary tract too and see how how those indications apply. You can see that in there, it'll give very specific indications for the use of, uh, if you have a prostate problem, then we'll talk about salt and metal, for instance, and so forth. Here's a couple other handouts that I've got too, you might as well take these. This is on the uh, use of a liquid, the one thing we have is liquid hydrastis. 
I think the golden seal is also good at applying it to the tampon and inserting it vaginally for all kinds of uh, different problems. Oh yeah, I'm going to stop this for one second because there's another product that we make that's an old naturopathic treatment that I have to tell you about because it should come in handy for everybody here. And we call it Badge Pack Medicine Base. And what it is is basically anhydrous magnesium sulfate basic thing, and it has in it some other herbs like golden seal, thuya, so on and so forth. Uh, it's in the literature, it's in our product can now that we got. If you've got a patient that has a class three or class four PAP, you want to reverse that. This stuff will work in many, many, many cases. And it only takes uh, a couple of treatments, usually it's a, you know, an in-office treatment. But what we do is generally uh, use a Tractor, speculum. Use a speculum and uh, uh, take the material that we got in the badge pack. It's like thick, like honey. And you take a four by four gauze pad. They call the company and you ask about it. We send it out to you. you know, and, and but have these use a four by four gauze pad, or you use some uh, like uh, lamb's wool, Dr. Scholl's lamb's wool. You lay a piece of a flat and take a big glop of this batch pack medicine base and put it in the center of this thing and you draw it up. We usually use a dental floss and tie it in a knot so you got this little pouch with a long string on it. So you use the speculum and then you uh, insert this right up next to the cervix. You generally leave it there for 24 to 48 hours and then you, and then you can remove it. And depending on how severe the case is, you can repeat it. You can repeat it like every other day if you want, or every three days, but sometimes only one treatment is enough. It just depends on it's class four and you know, where they're going after it. But, um, and also it's good for cervical erosions. Um, uh, uh, Leucorrhea's, candidiasis type situation, <coughs> Any, anything like that. Um, so you can. You can repeat it fairly often. Sometimes what we do is also take that out and, and intermittently apply uh, beta carotene to the cervix, cervical area too. So you can take like the text beta carotene, dab it on, and apply that to the cervix alternately. It seems to have a good effect. And I've had some really very good dramatic results with uh, reversing class threes that were going for hysterectomies, class fours, and so on. So anyway, if you go, you can go through this flowchart system. How much time is there? About. What time we got? Ten minutes to twelve. Twelve. Well, I'm going to go through these real quick because urinary tract is one of my favorite. Do you sell the oral some up? Yeah, buku, buchu. Sell the tincture. You can buy that. You can buy the beef all. Is it in the catalog? Yeah, it should be. It's, we got a new price list out. We got a new order form, so it's in there now. It wasn't before. It's one of them that we have to import. What is it used for? It's a diuretic. It's used for toxicity. It, it's great for people that you check with EAD that have like um, paint thinners and paints and this and types of things on the people that are painters. For instance, uh, I'll give you an example. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, inherent knowledge in this flowchart. Looks very simple, but uh, you can really explain everything here pretty well. You understand the error like Arctostaphylus. It's not. It's not this. Yeah, it's Arctostaphylus, the second one down there. Arctostaphylus uberursi. See, the most commonly called uberursi type so That is not. Even though this is inflammation in the urinary tract, a lot of these things. Can be looked at sometimes as diuretics, but arctostaphylus is high in uh, tannic acids, along with some other uh, components, the phenol type components, and it doesn't have a diuretic action at all. It's just strictly uh, antibacterial. So you can see it's effective for E. coli, Staph aureus, Candida, specifically for those things because of high tannic content. And it also is effective if you have an alkaline pH in the urine, because uva ursi isn't that effective in an acid pH whatsoever. So, verosum is more effective for 
rosmaline, which is Bushu, is more effective when you have an acid pH versus an alkaline pH where you use arctostaphylos. Arctostaphylos. Arctostaphylos yeah. Oh. Okay, yeah. Yeah, if you ever want to just kind of basically call 800 FDA herb and ask me what's on the flowchart list, you know, you don't have a book, you want to know, just call me and I'll tell you what's in the book and get, give you an idea to get some kind of start. So, I'll go through these quick. So, for the stiatus thing, you've got different herbs. You've got urethritis, you know, notice Althea is up here. Althea is called marshmallow, and that's a real gummy, gooey type thing, so it helps soothe the, uh, soothe the uh, urinary tract keep it from being real irritated. So it's, a, you know, it's useful in those things. You can combine these things too. You don't have to use just one herb. You can use two. You can use all five of those things. If somebody came in with brief rise and you didn't have the rest of the diagnosis, well, you probably could get away with going to the whole five or get a basic, basic idea if it's chronic or not and start applying them that way. Uh, Ed, does eclectic have a, uh, like a legend, uh, the, the Latin name, the common name, the no, only, well, we don't have it listed that way. If you want a book that does that, that John Lust's That's a Lust. Herb Book, it's called The Herb Book, has a really good index. That'd be a good idea, though, just to have that available on the, on the sheet. We don't have them listed by, we have them all in their tentacle name, we don't have them listed by. Sometimes you want to look it up, you got, you want yeah. to put it in. Yeah, it is. That'd be a good idea for us to provide it. So bacteria, if you've got infections, so on and so forth, and you can get over there. Prostatitis, chronic, you got just general prostatitis, and why each one of these has an effect is somewhat known, uh, but then you don't necessarily need to understand everything about the herb in order to try to get close to using one of these pieces of material. What did you say your book's going to be ready? About, it's probably about six weeks. Will we be notified? Uh, yeah, I can, uh, I think, did everybody sign that <coughs> list that went around? Oh, oh. oh. Did you have oh, to put on these lists? Have, uh, oh, you do? You already have made out? Well, yeah, it's general oh. passage. You, you, with with their certificate, you get a roster. Oh, okay. And then uh, you'll get one. So I'll get one. So I was just going to send them to a list and thanks to people that wanted it, but I'll send it here. But, um, so anyways, it goes through that. I don't think I have to get into it more to get the idea. But I was hoping that maybe there'd be one that I could explain a little bit in simpler forms during this semester. So, um, you can see the saliva is not in here. Milk thistle, or even card, it was called cardis at the time. It's not listed on here. So, there's cianeltis there, which is you know, hepatodynia on the bottom here. So, cianeltis is one of the indications. So, we've got hepatomegaly, cianeltis, which is the spleen remedy. More so, it's in there, and it's also in the kidney. You won't see it in jaundice, and you won't see it in congestion of liver. And there's rationale for why you won't. How, how effective was that pain formula there? Or, or you don't know? What pain formula? Oh, you just had a pain formula? formula? But this is just pain for the liver. Huh? Yeah, liver pain. Right. Specific for the liver. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. only in the end of So, everything else is useful. Let me all that. about Siberian ginseng, but I think you're going to talk about that, aren't you, Dr. Marshall? Siberian ginseng? Talk about that? You talked about it. Oh, you talked about it. Oh, I'll be talking about it. Okay. All right, I'll just go real quick on Siberian ginseng. I've been using that myself for um, a while. I think it's a good overall tonic. It's much like American ginseng. Uh, I think it, in people that are immune compromised, that the use of a, an adaptogen is called would be very effective. Adaptogen means something that has a specific or non-specific enhancement of the, of the body's overall resistance. So you can, the body's overall effect. So you can, it approves uh, adaptation to like heat and to cold and to stress, particularly those three things. Uh, 
rumor has it, which is probably true, I haven't seen the literature yet, all the studies come out of Russian, it's hard to translate the Russian stuff, plus it's difficult to get hold of sometimes. Supposedly the cosmonauts were using uh, Siberian ginseng for, it's probably an old story, probably everybody, I mean, everyone tells, whatever herb it is, the cosmonauts probably use it for most sales, but, um, <laughs> but it does seem to have a good effect. I mean, I, I've used it. It does seem to have an overall improved what I call the tensile strength of the body. It seems to make you more resilient, more uh, capable of dealing with stress. Also, it's also somewhat soporific or uh, induces sleep, but it's not a sleep tonic. It's not a sedative itself, like valerian or hops would be. It's more of a of a tonifying herb that allows your nervous system, well, I would say, allows your nervous system to become less irritable and therefore makes you a little bit more relaxed. Like it might be like saying adding calcium to your diet so you have to be to some extra calcium or even possibly tryptophan. But, um, but I uh, have had good experience on myself using the Siberian ginseng for a set, it's calming effect and uh, also seems to be able to handle stress a little bit better using it. The, the Russia, in, in Russia, the reason they developed that whole thing was because there's all this ginseng going around, the sales of ginseng, American ginseng, and it's real expensive, so the Russians got onto this, but let's develop a cheap alternative to uh, American ginseng, or even Korean ginseng, or whatever. And so they had 10 million hectares, whatever hectare is, this stuff going around, and they've worked on it for 20 years. The main researcher is Breckman in uh, Russia, has done most of the studies on it, and has also uh, provided uh, you know, standardized material for Siberian ginseng. So if you ever want to experiment on, on an herb on yourself or give to some patients, I'd suggest Siberian ginseng, less expensive. Ten drops a day is enough to start with. After about um, two or three weeks, you can, I'd say you can start experimenting with higher doses. If you're going to go under more stress, take like up to 30 or 40 drops or even 80 drops a day. And if you're going to go like, say, get, uh, flying, so for jet lag or staying out late, so on and so forth. Uh, don't forget milk thistle for going on uh, alcoholic binges and things like that, parties and things <coughs> like that. You might want to take a good dose of milk thistle before you do that. Before or after? Before. Protect okay. the liver. Because it does that. It protects the liver really well. And if you've got any patients that are going in for any kind of, you know, or, or going into any kind of environment where it's real fumy. Uh, one, uh, the herb the herb is not used very much, but uh, it's Opalopanax iridium, the devil's club. It grows uh, prolifically in the Pacific Northwest. It's got these little spines. It looks, it's in the same family as Siberian ginseng. Almost looks like Siberian ginseng, except it's a lot bigger. So I get to attack you. And uh, so it could be a good substitute. I haven't seen any analysis on it compared to Siberian ginseng, but American, like you suggesting, why wouldn't do anything with American herbs? Well, this would be a good place to start. Uh, what is the name of that again? Claw? This is Devil's Club, not Devil's Claw. Devil's Claw is used for something else. But um, here's some uh, something to please the appetite since you all chew on that prickly ash. These are freeze dried cranberries. All the studies I've done, we've done a little monograph on cranberries. It seems to be highly effective in, in uh, urinary tract infections and. Oh, this does really work. We use the we do the freeze dry, and if you've got some uh, urinary tract infections, uh, also it helps reduce ammonia smell. So if you've got some uh, chronic bedwetting patients or even kids, I guess you can give them cranberries and reduce that ammonia smell. Um, and it, there's also you know when you buy when you get cranberries and you give it for uh, urinary tract infections, often it's got sugar in it. Studies seem to think maybe it's sugar doesn't hinder the effect that much. Uh, cranberries seem to have an effect, not because of its pH, but because it doesn't allow bacteria to attach to the cell wall in, in, the, in the bladder or the urethra or whatever. It keeps it at bay. It seems to be the most clearly indicated mechanism for that. Any yeah. other formulas for jet lag besides the segment Well, that's what I want to mention. No. I'm, well, you could maybe try this for jet lag. But I would, uh, this is the Devil's, Devil's Club, but I'm not. It's not using much. We tend to use it more to stabilize blood sugar. Uh, although I've never really seen anything that great for, for, uh, for diabetes yet. Oh, man. Yeah. Okay. For parasites, I guess. Does everybody know about Artemisia anua 
Yeah. How many people what? know all the, the whole riff about our museum of parasites? Never heard of it. You've heard of it? No. Uh, well, Leo, Leo Galland, he was, um, he's kind of won an MD there in New York who's been kind of promoting it a lot. What it was was the Army recently, over well, the last five years, has been studying our museum animal, which is like wormwood. So this comes from, this is Chinese wormwood. Uh, there's a lot of wormwoods in America. Uh, Uzo is made from wormwood. Uh, there's all kinds of wormwoods that grow here prolifically. Uh, and they're somewhat hallucinogenic, as so is fennel. But you, uh, they were studying it for a substitute for quinine in the Army the last five years and working with Purdue University and uh, Walter Reed Hospital and everything. And uh, so we had all this little bit of connection with this going on, and then it kind of got dropped by the Army a little bit. I don't know what they found out. It's too expensive to produce, but it's really inexpensive. I don't know if it was that effective or not. But the upshot of it was that all of a sudden, Leo Gallon started to talk about this being effective in uh, oh, intermediate histolyticas and giardia and so forth. So I have a data that talks about it specifically. Um, so, the general thing I do. So, amoebicide, giardiocide, and dient amoebicide. I don't know what dient amoebicide is. And they're usually recommending about, you know, in the terms of this type of capsule, you're taking you know, two of them three times a day. You stop for approximately two weeks, and then you repeat it. And then you do, you for do one more. Week, for one week or two weeks? Take, take it for two capsules, three times a day, for no less than 20 days. 20 days. Capsules should be taken with meals or a piece of banana to prevent esophageal or gastric irritation. And then. Uh, Did you spell that for me? Artemisia? Yeah. Yes. Uh, The, the other companies that I know that sell this product are Allergy Research. Allergy Research. Now, this one, I was trying to find out why Artemisia animal for parasites. Other than the fact that wormwoods are commonly, you know, must, even before Leo Gallon knew about it, somebody must have wised up and said, gee, it kills worms. They named it wormwood, but they didn't have a document of signatures for that. But uh, why they use the Artemisia animal over anything else, I don't think anybody knows. I don't know if it's just this thing that maybe, you know, they thought it was scarce and they had the only source of it or something. But um, I don't know why it's any more indicated than anything else. You said it's a specific for antamoebas? Yeah, that's what they're, that's why it's being reported. I don't know if it works or not. Well, there's one group of periodontists that the periodontal problem is a result of antamoeba gingivalis. So my work pretty good there. Yeah, would you do that locally or like or you do the internally, I guess? I internally and then uh, so uh, what other parasitic formulas do you have for let's say specifically worms? Well mm. in that book there's something that book talks about parasites and so forth. Uh, anyway, so I cleared that up. So anyways you take it. Uh, the results are still positive after the 20 days thing. For uh, then the second round of treatment is again indicated in the follow-up lab work. Uh, he says that his experience is that three negative tests, four to six weeks apart, is appropriate criteria for a recovery. So if those suffering repeated attacks of antibiotics and giardia, it's recommended to check every six months for two or three years. He reports there's a Herxheimer type reaction that's frequently reported with this. And I've also found in literature that if you kill parasites internally, they do produce this toxin that can manifest itself in the skin. I'm not sure if that's Herxheimer, but that sort of follows that path. It's that we were on our hands. So that's where this reaction comes from in the candida? Catch-all. Well, maybe. I mean, that's somewhat, supposedly you're killing the, uh, the spores, spores or the, yeah. the buds or the can budding candida and it's producing some enteral toxin and that's causing it or it's the capsule of the end of the, of the, the uh, candida that's causing the antigen reaction. But, okay, the naturopathic lady, 
I've spent a lot of time looking at this before for no reason for Giardia, particularly as to what would be used early overall. And things that I came up with all the time for Giardia would be chaparral and black walnut. Dr. Mallory talked about black walnut, butternut. Black walnut is hugelins. That's the botanical name, hugelins. Um, anyways, and butternut's also a hugelins. Hugelins nigra, which is black walnut, and hugelins <coughs> is butternut. Or, and mapaquinones may be associated with black walnut as well. I don't know if they are or not. Pelagi gases. Yeah. Well, what? When you talk about black walnuts, you're not talking about eating the nut as being effective. You're talking about the leaves, green leaves are somewhat effective, although they're not very concentrated. The other thing that we use is the hulls. And uh, these, you can look at these. It's not that clear. They're a little dusty, but the uh, hulls, if you look at them closely, aren't. Black walnut, if you've ever seen black walnuts laying around on the ground, they're, they get really, the hulls get really black, black, black. Well, what we do is we get the green hulls. You need to have the green hulls. And then we freeze dry the green hulls. It's taken about three years to figure out how to do this. And because as soon as you cut the hull off, it turns black on the edges, but the inside of it, the inside, you look on the surface of the hull and the underneath of the hull is black, a little strip. But the cross section, you'll see it's all green inside. So we grind them up, put them in these capsules. The active component of black walnut, as far as I know, one of the active components is hugelone. But when it gets near oxygen, it, it oxidizes the hugelone, which is a very much inactive form. So a lot of the, now, if you want to even treat tinea, uh, ringworm, or anything, you, you want to get rid of that type, any kind of fungal infections topically. The best thing that I know of is just the juice of a fresh hull, black walnut hull, green hull, on that area, and just keep applying it topically. That'll knock it out. Thuya will knock it out too, but I think thuya is very suppressive for, for ringworm. But it does knock it. I mean, it'll go away, but it comes back when you stop using it sometimes. Um, Juice of the fresh black hole and the green hole. hole is yeah, or you could take the leaves, but the leaves are less concentrated. You take the leaves of that, you know, grind them up in your hands and put them on there. Now, the reason, you know, the reason why your hands turn black is because, you know, it's oxidizing and that's why you get that black stuff in there. So, what we're trying with this thing with the freeze-dried black walnut hulls is to see if the activity of black walnut is enhanced due to the freeze-drying effect of trying to get the hugelone down there because it is antifungal. Black walnut is something attributed to antifungal, but a lot of these things have and been resolved as to, you know, like a lot of folkloric literature is handed down and pass it from one person to the next. The next guy's writing a book, he writes the same thing and it gets on and on and on and on. But, you know, when you use them a lot clinically, you don't really see the results that's been attributed to the material. And so uh, that's one that I think has some potential in being antifungal and anti-candidal is black walnut if it's, if it's fresh material. How about for, uh, let's say, acid or something like that? Yeah, well, sure. It'll, I mean, the fresh stuff will work. And what you could do with these capsules, too, if you wanted to, of course, the problem is that their foot turns black. But you could take that, take the capsule out and put it in the compress and put it on there and see how that works. Would yeah. taking the Charlie also suppress the fungal form It should if you follow the same rationale as using griseofluorine on a micronized salt. So it has the same reaction. Well, I think uh, you're going to have to, if you can knock the hypey out from underneath, from, you know, from lower tissue through the blood vessels, as opposed to then work it up to the top and do the keratolytic to scrape off, you know, scrape off the, you know, like the micronized salt, I suppose, as you can do that. Um, homeopathic. So you're saying put this up the top topically, though, you said? Well, I mean, that's the way you can get some real demonstrable effects of that. You know, if you've got somebody who's got, let's see, that their hands are going to be black with using this topically, so they might not want to. Thuya may be a better application. But thuya, if you're using Thuya, it's real strong. I think that the weaker you use Thuya, the tea tree, the better off you are in having long-term effects. Uh, why don't we entertain questions for about five minutes and then Okay. Yep. What works good for lupus among the systemic kind? Uh, if I don't know of anything that works well. What I've been working, trying to get to, and I didn't get to talk about this, is chaparral. Try it. Oral DMSO. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. The two things that botanically that I think are important to DMSO as you can get is ginger and chaparral. Those things have the ability to like to boom right through tissues and into the body. If you want to, if you want to move things, herbs, 
add chaparral or ginger to those to those, those products, and uh, you can get a deeper tissue effect. I think. Like chaparral, it works, and also it grows on 20 million acres in the southwest, so there's lots of it. Uh, the freeze drying of chaparral might have some in indications that would be appropriate. Also, I didn't really think so when we first started freeze drying, but the more I researched it, there is a quinone that oxidizes pretty rapidly when air hits it, so it might be more effective or it could be less effective at this point. If you get good chaparral, you're going to affect chaparral so abundant there's really no need to adulterate it. So, but the, it, the activity is maintained in the, the end leaves and the stems, not in the whole plant. So it's, it's nice to get a, a good a good part of the plant that's uh, also. Uh, did you have a question? Um, yeah, you're talking about if you kill parasites internally, the toxins uh, react to the skin? That's what I've heard. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it within a few times, but no, it's good. Well, well, you can either, I think, you know, about the only way to treat it is, that I know of is to uh, just go start out with a little bit lower dosage and gradually, you know, not overdo the dosage initially. First, step. The other way might be to you know, try to get the lymphatic system and the liver all cleaned up so that you can handle more of the enterotoxin and come on possibly a fast before get your system ready to be activated. Um, possibly, I don't, I don't know if I have any suggestions. You might be able to neutralize the effect with something like uh, technician. Roundworms and things like that. Well, um, garlic's pretty good about. There's a lot of things. Um, I got a little fruit. I think I have a fruit list here. Um, okay, we use it. Sometimes we use like uh, our liver flesh, which is garlic, garlic, uh, you know, olive oil, and a little bit of lemon in there. And you can kind of put a couple cloves of garlic and some lemon juice and olive oil and blend it up. And drink that. And that'll flush the liver pretty good. I mean, we're going to use a little caution there now. People have got you know, gallstones and so on. Um, I sometimes use beets then as on a diet. Prior to that, getting the beets that have really got a little bit of acridity to them. They tend to get these parasites somewhat moving. There's also some of those um, sulfax. Uh, oh, I know what's called. Um, It was it's close to the right matter. Oh, the one thing that you could do is check that Weiss book. He's got some very specific dosage information about how to treat some different kinds of parasites. And, if, and if using, he's using some of the very toxic herbs like Chenopodium, worm seed, all this, Dryopterus, male fern, all these things that I couldn't really explain to you very well how to use them. They're, they're always been reported effective, but they're also pretty high toxicity and you can't know how to use them. But he explains pretty clearly how to apply those things. So that's a good place to check. All the digestive enzymes and all those things. Yeah. 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 Now, if I have this correct, Ed's going to be leaving early. Yeah, but I want to collect Okay, after lunch. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, I want to thank you for the excellent presentation here this morning. And all, some of the formulas that he was talking about, like the uh, olive oil, liver flush, uh, you can find that in the two volumes of natural medicine by uh, was it yeah. Prisano? Prisano and Murray. And, and, Murray uh, yeah. and you get that from John Basher. And if you haven't got those, get that, because it's really a lot of good information in there. Uh, the dentist may not use all of it, but uh, certainly the physician should know all that. Uh, and don't, don't forget uh, June, for those of you who have to leave early, June 27th through the 30th, uh, neural therapy, somatotopies, and reflex symptoms. And this is going to be a blockbuster seminar because uh, uh, this is information you're not going to get any place else. Uh, also, in conjunction with this, we're going to have a, a Colorado a rafting trip seminar. We have a few places open. If anybody's interested in that, see me and I'll give you a brochure you can read about it. Uh, anybody got to add or subtract anything? Let's uh, come back at 1.30. I have to get my camera rolling here. Ed's got to get out of the way. Okay. Time to start. So we have no harata here for taping.
Yeah, well, let me get that going here. No harada. No harada. No, I got it. Harada. 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 You got to roll the R's. It's like ha. H-A. Harada. That's the way they say it. He's calling Vaughn. That's all they say. If you grew up in southern Washington, Utah, you know. Southern Washington. You know how to say Harada. It's like ha. San Jose. San Jose. San Jose. San Jose. San Jose. Okay, let's see here. We want to get going and we want to mention a few things. Um, I had some notes back here on some things that Ed said. Milk thistle is often used uh, for, as Ed said, is for, for taking care of alcoholics, bringing them back to normal, bringing them down, curing their addiction. Um, so it's interesting when they put milk thistle in an alcoholic extract that this doesn't make much sense to me. Why would you? And then they give it to an alcoholic to cure him. But they do that sometimes. That's just one of those little anomalies that are going on in Europe now that do not make much sense. Is it milk thistle? Yeah, milk thistle to treat alcoholics, but they sometimes put it in an alcoholic base. To me, that doesn't make much sense. Um, I want to follow up on something that I, that from yesterday, we talked a little bit about, well, we talked quite a bit about an herbal antibiotics, and one that I didn't go into great detail on, but which I wanted to, is licorice root. And so today I thought I would just tell one study in particular that I thought was fascinating uh, for licorice root along those lines. <clears throat> they, uh, in the first part of the experiment, they took strains of, of Staphylococcus aureus mainly, and uh, made them resistant to penicillin and streptomycin. Uh, and then, uh, of course, succeeding generations of those particular strains were totally resistant, or you know, 90%, 98% resistant to these penicillins, uh, to the antibiotics. <clears throat> this was just a simple Petri dish study. You know, we culture the first group in this Petri dish, and then we take the survivors and put them in the next one, and so on down throughout. And it takes about seven generations before you develop a resistant strain. Well, the time they were doing that, they also cultured um, colonies to uh, and subjected them to licorice root treatment, an extract of licorice root, actually. And they found that in the first Petri dish, if you will, that particular group was um, more resist, uh, uh, was more susceptible to the penicillins, to the regular normal antibiotics, than they were to the licorice root. The licorice root, in other words, was less effective. Uh, whereas it might have, the penicillin was 90% effective, somewhere in that range, the licorice root came in at about 80%. In the next generation, of course, the effectiveness of the penicillins began to drop, but the resistance of these strains to licorice root did not increase through the full seven generations, the effectiveness of licorice root may have remained constant. So there seems to be some advantage, and nobody really knows what it is at this time, some advantage to using natural antibiotics in those realms. Uh, the strains of bacteria, for whatever reason, cannot develop a resistance to them. Following those seven uh, colonies, then they took the licorice root and administered it to the groups of, of um, bacteria that had developed resistance to the strains of ant regular antibiotics. And guess what? It was just as effective against those. So we have a different mechanism going on there. Apparently, a really superior kind of thing going on in my mind. This so is in Petri dishes. This right? is in Petri dishes, you bet. Yes. So there's actually some ingredient that is actually bactericidal yeah, on a physical level, probably. Somewhere, so yeah. Breaking the cell membrane wall exactly, or something like that? Exactly, exactly. Breaking it and uh, destroying the genetic material. Uh, but whatever it is, you know, you would still suspect that if you took 
the survivors out of the out of the first one that they would have a genetic resistance that would predispose them to be resistant to the licorice with from succeeding generations and for some reason that does not happen. Unless it's a physical so, mortality. So it, yeah, apparently it is not a genetic it's not a genetic resistance that's right. being developed. It is an anomalous resistance that occur, apparently occurs randomly uh, in a distribution of any pathogenic organism that we're talking about there. So anyway, that's, I thought that was a significant study, one that you probably want to know about. Good reason to use herbal antibiotics rather than the regular ones. Okay? Question. Question. Yeah. If you are getting ready, let's say, do a surgery on a patient, uh, how far in advance, you, since the herbal, they don't seem to work like that, regular antibiotics should maybe start after or before the surgery uh, for maybe a week or two weeks. Now, herbal antibiotics have a longer duration of action, you can use them for longer. Would you start it two weeks ahead of the surgery, a week ahead of the surgery, and then continue for a couple weeks after the surgery? I mean, I would start it as far in advance of the surgery as possible and continue it as far after as uh, there is any indication whatsoever that some sort of uh, secondary infection might occur or some uh, rebound effect might be observed. Uh, in terms of beforehand, if you're really dealing there with a, a wide variety of factors that are very individual, just in terms of the person's own state of health, the state of the organism. If they're a very healthy individual, obviously they would not need it, maybe, but for a few days. Right. But if they're already in a deteriorated state of some form or another, a depilitated state, they may need it for as long as possible. Because these, these uh, the herbal antibiotics, especially if you're using whole herb material, which is what I normally recommend, that you then you need that these are slower acting. They take longer to uh, to be manifested in the organism. So as long a period of time as you can you can uh, possibly gain or, or get afford. You gave us the list yesterday of verbal antibodies. Yes. Is this an addition to the list or? Well, I talked about licorice root at that yeah, time. Yeah, you did. Right. I just wanted to mention that study here. Okay. But yeah, it's on that list. It should be. Yes. Did you mention what the dosage would be for using this kind of a thing? Uh, it, uh, again, that's another one of those questions that's hard. Remember the diagram I drew yesterday about dosage, and that's pretty hard. But let's say you're using a regular powdered licorice root. Then we're talking here uh, probably in the order of two to five capsules uh, three times a day for an acute sort of condition. Two to three capsules two times a day for a, a chronic uh, infection or a chronic problem. Preoperatively, we're talking about uh, within, the, let's say, five days prior to operation, we're talking maybe anywhere from five to ten capsules two or three times a day, a lot. This is pre-kit? Yeah, preoperative, pre yeah. A week prior to, essentially. Uh, really load up on it in most cases. You have to remember that uh, 12, 12 capsules, 12 regular capsules of an herbal product represents about one tablespoon of material. And so that's not a lot of plant. I mean, what is a tablespoon of lettuce, after all? And a lot of these things we're talking about um, uh, factors or, or chemical constituents that are in there in fairly minute amounts. And so you need to, it doesn't hurt to take as much as you can. Obviously, you can collect fresh material and macerate it or create whatever fresh preparation you want out of it. Uh, you probably would need less. The more concentrated you can make the product, the, more, the less you will need. On the other hand, if you do go that route, you run the risk of, of course, eliminating the very chemicals that you're after in your preparation. And so unless you know an awful lot about how to prepare uh, fresh materials, I suggest you avoid doing that, and you take those that are already on the market. That also requires some knowledge of what's there. What do you use, whole herb material or an alcoholic extract? Which one would have in it what you need? So it requires that you become educated to some extent along those lines. Uh, again, something like licorice root, I recommend people use it daily. Uh, in one form or another, they can chew on the stick every day, use it as a tooth uh, cleanser if they want, you know, just make a toothbrush out of it, as I talked about, a couple of capsules every day, just something to, to keep this uh, herb in the system as much as possible. And licorice root does, does um, stay in the system longer than a lot of herbs do. The constituents seem to uh, not be excreted very rapidly, so it's just good for those purposes. Okay. Mm. I need some water already. <laughs> Sorry about that. I can feel my 
cheeks and my lips drying out here, you know. When that happens, I start talking weird. one day and he says, what's a millennium? I said, well, I think it's kind of like a centennial, only it has more legs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, today, <laughs> I promised uh, several of you yesterday that I would talk about today ways that you can use herbs to uh, decrease the effects of environmental pollution. And uh, the sources of that pollution then would be from the air, airborne pollutants, waterborne pollutants, uh, food-borne uh, pollutants, uh, maybe even those pollutants that are in your, your um, fillings, huh? <laughs> especially those kind, okay? If you're like me and you have a lot of those, a lot of that mercury still in your mouth, you might want to know if there's some herb to help neutralize the effects of that. And I think that there's some evidence to suggest that there are ways to do that. Um, <clears throat> There are two levels of entry into this discussion, and the herbal uh, literature that I have read is really, really only predominates in one. The two levels are what do you do with uh, heavy metals, for example, that are already have already accumulated in the tissues of the body. That is, they have been carried there in the diet or uh, through normal metabolic and uh, systems absorptive systems in the blood. They've been laid in the tissues and they've been there for a long time. Can you get that out? The other entry point is how do you prevent that from happening in the first place? And it's in that second area that the effects of herbs predominate. I don't believe that the, uh, the idea of stripping the heavy metals and other and radioactive materials and so forth out of the tissues has been addressed very adequately in the herbal research to date. However, I would say this, that we can suggest that uh, those same herbs that prevent may in some measure also uh, take care of stripping it out. We, we just have to assess that on a case-by-case -case basis. The first group of plants that I want to talk about are what uh, I can call algin or kelp. <coughs> um, algin Sodium alginate, if you will, or algin, A-L-G-I-N, is a substance that it predominates in brown kelp. In fact, is only found in brown species of kelp. Now, if you go into health food stores and so forth, you can find red and green kelp for sale under various names and for various purposes. Green kelp and red kelp are both very good hypotensive agents. But if you're interested in this particular form of uh, the particular mechanism we're talking about today, and the anti-toxic properties, then you have to go with brown kelp, and preferably you go with some sort of sodium alginate or algin extract from that. What's happened, what these do is they prevent the absorption of, uh, of heavy metals and radioactive substances. Uh, among those that have been investigated are strontium-90, barium, mercury, zinc, tin, cadmium, manganese, and zinc. Iron has also been looked at. Uh, when I was in Sweden a couple of years ago, it was just after the Chernobyl situation, and uh, these people were really very much concerned about the, what the effects of that disaster were going to be in their diet, because the stuff was in the soil all over the country. It was being picked up by the plants. And uh, this is very much on their mind, and there was a case in point where uh, you, they had to eat. There was no way that they could really avoid doing that. And as they looked about them, they knew for certain that there was strontium-90 kicking around other radioactive substances kicking around in their plant materials. And to further complicate that, they were aware, or at least some of them were aware, of the insi particularly insidious nature of strontium-90 in that it uh, has a great affinity for calcium. 
and so it accumulates in foods that are high in calcium, and that would include your, what, um, most of your green leafy vegetables, cow's milk, would be, it would be laid down in the milk products that in the countries that are involved. Uh, it, it was going to be something that would, would be pretty ubiquitous in what they were doing. And uh, since it's then bound to the calcium ion, it would be tr transported directly to the bone marrow, uh, where it would damage the marrow, and hence could produce uh, debilitating conditions as a result of that, leukemia and so forth. Uh, so they were looking for something that would, uh, that maybe would prevent that from happening, and then it turns out uh, algin, or brown kelp, uh, is well suited for that. A series of tr research trials that, were that took place in Canada, for example, found that it blocked, that actually was able to strip the uh, radioactive, radioactive molecule off of the calcium molecule uh, and uh, bind it up as an insoluble salt, which would then be secreted harmlessly in the stool. And, and that's essentially how kelp works. So you can see that it, its primary level of operation is in the GI tract and not in the tissues of the body. Uh, and so it's a preventive measure and not a treatment for you know, things that are already in the tissues. The formations of the insoluble salts with the sodium alginate then uh, is a very important mechanism and one that we need to capitalize on uh, in a medicinal sense and also in a dietary sense. Yes? Uh, if uh, we're giving x-rays to patients would this be one of the herbs that you think about for x-ray protection? Uh, for x-ray protection, not necessarily, but uh, I mean, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I don't know whether this, there are certain, I, I would think Siberian ginseng would be a really good candidate for that. That's why I don't know about kelp. Yes? Um, some of the stuff I'm reading is saying that kelp, <coughs> there's so much pollution that depending on where you get your kelp depends upon how polluted you're going to be bringing things in your system and that someone who's real sensitive <coughs> to heavy metals or having that kind of a problem then kelp in, in that case may add to the problem. Yeah, but that is not true. As it turns out, the, uh, excuse me, that's a good theory, but in practice it doesn't work that way. Apparently, the, uh, any of the toxins that are accumulating kelp are uh, or in very insignificant levels, levels, and again, are almost in-house combined with the salts and excreted from the body. They, they are not absorbed by the body. Um, this, you know, sometimes this is not good. Uh, sometimes you may be interested in uh, supplementing your diet with zinc, and it would not be a good idea to combine it with kelp in that case because it was going to, it's probably not going to be absorbed. And uh, a lot of the minerals that are in kelp uh, have a hard time finding their way into the body in brown kelp because the algae is so, if you're looking at, at kelp as a source for those kinds of minerals, maybe the green or the red kelp would be a better source or for iodine and so forth. But it seems to be have a particular affinity for the heavy metals and so some of the other kinds of nutrients and things probably are being absorbed all right. But um, these researchers look specifically for that your problem you just addressed. Uh, and they knew that some of the algae that they were administering already had these kinds of problems, and so they looked for it. Are these trace elements going to be absorbed because we're using this product? And they weren't, so they, they controlled for that variable. Okay, kelp, of course, uh, you know, is a very good antitoxic substance, even along other lines. Um, it's antioxidant, anti-carcinogenic, and anti-toxic uh, over a wide range of materials. One of the earliest observations that was made with kelp was that the women in uh, Japan who used ground kelp or other forms of kelp in their diet uh, had a very low incidence of uh, breast cancer. Uh, so uh, this observation then inspired a lot of researchers to go looking for possible mechanisms of how that might, did you see, it, well, see what the kelp was responsible or some other part of the diet was responsible, what was going on, and uh, many longitudinal studies have been carried out to, to uh, try to determine that, and the result has been that they are pretty, uh, I wouldn't say 100% convinced, but they're about 90% convinced that it is totally to the, to the uh, level of kelp in the diet. They use kelp 
in almost all of their dishes. And we're talking here about the folk people of Japan, if you will. The more westernized they become, the higher the rate of breast cancer becomes. And uh, say a lot of the Japanese move to Hawaii, and as soon as they do, the incidence of breast cancer goes up. And uh, so they trace, so this seems to be the one constant factor then is what is what's happening in their diet. Incidentally, the, a recent trial looked at Western women in California who were beginning to eat a lot more kelp, kombu, and such things. And uh, the tentative conclusion is that the incidence of breast cancer is going down in these women. Maybe sushi. Like yes, yeah, sushi, exactly. A lot is that, of that. Is that brown kelp that they wrap that in? Uh, they, I think they use, yeah, they use green, they use, huh? That's nori, N-O-R-I, that they're wrapping. Nori, and that kind of variety of kelp is that, do you know that offhand? Well, it's green I, or colored. I think, well, it's probably the green kelp, then. There's a, there's the three main varieties that they use, and they probably use all of them in one way or another. <clears throat> the mechanism of action of, of, of the way kelp is able to detoxify the body through the GI tract has been investigated to some extent. And these are the kinds of things they've come up with. These are possibilities that are being investigated. One is that kelp is a good source of non-digestible fiber, and so therefore it increases fecal bulk, and just generally improves the health of the GI tract, helps uh, people eliminate these things in a better fashion. Uh, in older people especially, kelp has been a, used as a very effective laxative a very non-irritating laxative, very effective one, non-habituating. Uh, it reduces cholesterol by the inhibition of bile acid absorption, and thereby, thereby prevents cancer that is sometimes caused by faulty metabolism of the bile acids. And uh, that would include also steroid, sterols and steroid hormones that are sometimes implicated in cancerous uh, growth. It, uh, it's been known to alter the basic uh, nature of the fecal flora so that it neutralizes carcinogenic bacteria, another mechanism. And then in some studies, kelp has been shown to have a direct cytotoxic effect on cancerous, cancerous cells. So it's a good stuff to have in the diet. And uh, especially if you live in, a, in an area where the chances for heavy metal toxicity abound, you could even say that as the mercury vapors are coming out of the amalgams into the mouth, that uh, if you are using kelp in your diet, you may be able to tie some of that up and keep it from being absorbed into the tissues of the body. There is that possibility. Yes? Do you have a good source for kelp? Uh, I think there's a lot of good sources for kelp. Uh, the only thing you need, what I would, instead of looking for kelp for this particular purpose, however, I would look for algin sodium alginate, okay, because if you look at kelp, you might be getting those species of kelp that don't contain algin in any significant amount. So the algin is the thing you want to look for. It. I, I have a chapter in the book that talks about that, so if I have a chapter on it, then I'm sure Solaray makes it. <laughs> yes, I'm sure Solaray does, but also natural sunshine makes it. I nature guess sunshine? Most, yeah, nature sunshine. Right? Yeah, they probably do. Well, I know they do. I have it. Oh, you know they do. You have it. Okay. Is it known as brown kelp? Or it's called algae. What? Hmm? It's called algae. Algae. Like yeah. And it's uh, sodium alginate. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, there's, uh, I think that uh, this is one product that maybe has been overlooked a little bit in the health food movement throughout the country. There are little pockets of people here and there that, that are tuned into to using kelp, but it isn't really ubiquitous yet. So in the blends of the combinations that I generally suggest for companies to use, I very often stick kelp in there because I think it's just a great detoxifier and a substance that can do a lot to promoting the health in addition to all of the nutrients and things that are in there, in addition to the iodine that is in it, which is very beneficial. Uh, it just has these effects I was talking about that are very, very strong and very good and reliable. Um, but, you know, I can talk for a long time and, and <laughs> not necessarily going to make any headway. Okay, another substance along those lines is pectin. And pectin is uh, normally derived from apples, apple pectin, if you will. 
Uh, the Soviets have done quite a bit of research on this. And um, they have come up with similar findings to that which the Japanese and the Americans and the Canadians have found with algin, in that it is able to uh, ensure that lead and mercury are excreted effectively and harmlessly in the diet. Yes. Do you recommend a supplement with the trace minerals in while people are taking these kind of things? Uh, they're they're chelators actually. Uh, mm -hmm. That are well, yeah. There's well, chelation is a little different process. I think we're talking here about a uh, a covalent bond that is being produced between these things. And so, but yeah, I I recommend that you don't use them. Um, what you I suppose you could just supplement your diet with, uh, with some kind of a mineral source while you're using these. Um, on the other hand, you can take them in between meals, or you can take them at meals or at times when you think that uh, you're experiencing a problem. Uh, they do not seem, like I say, the kelp and the pectin do not seem to affect the absorbability of the, your normal nutrients and minerals. But of those that I mentioned, it does. Uh, beyond that, it doesn't seem to. But they're both a preoperative detoxifier. Mm -hmm. They're both a preoperative detoxifier. Well, I think they're a detoxifier at any time. Yeah, I mean, after you got the... Will it take it out of the uh, body cell system? And uh, that is... Well, it's in that sense. I see what you're coming away from. Um, no, yeah, they'd be preoperative in that sense. But they would be concomitant. I mean, they'd be something you want to do right along with your procedures. At any time, these things would be introduced into the body. You'll want something there to help detoxify them. And so beforehand, wouldn't work that much. Mm -hmm. It's right simultaneous that it's going to do the job. Yes. But if they're if they're taking out zinc, the zinc is one of the things that you've got to have there for healing. Yes, I know. So that's why I said a supplement at the same time would be a good idea. Otherwise, yeah, you're going to run into that problem. And uh, I don't know of a zinc deficiency being caused by the application of these. Um, I do know that <coughs> that um, some people will do supplement their diet with a lot more zinc than they need for normal conditions. Uh, you know, there's a lot of debate going on right now about what is the role of zinc is in health, and there are some studies that show the uh, some moderate levels of zinc are going to be very good for the immune system and very good for uh, overall health, uh, in ge you know, general health. And uh, so you wouldn't want to deplete the body of zinc, but the chances of doing that are fairly low. Um, and in case of doubt, I would say supplement the diet with zinc or uh, use that at a time other than when you're using the kelp. Just take your supplement of zinc off of the schedule. Don't ever take them at the same time. I guess that's the key to it right there. Yeah, I would do that. So if you're using kelp with your meal, then, then you're, you're probably going to experience some malabsorption of the dietary zinc you're getting. That's just something that really needs to be looked at, however. Um, just to what extent something like zinc is being depleted. The uh, pectin does not deplete the zinc, and the kelp does. Okay. All right, now the pectin, uh, there are other substances like pectin. There's wheat bran and alfalfa, even burdock root. Um, they're very fibrous in nature. Uh, they're uh, operate pretty much the same way, and they've been you looked at in a lot of research in this country, even, for their effect on various kinds of toxins, especially food additives. So we know, for example, that these substances can protect the body against food additives like amaranth and uh, tween-60, sodium cyclamate, tartrazine, and uh, various other food additives and food colorings that we see all the time, sunset yellow and so forth. So you'll see on almost all the bottles you on the, on the shelves of the store. Uh, they, they prevent the absorption of these things in the body. So I guess what I'm looking at here uh, with these kinds of compounds is, is just a way that uh, in the normal everyday course of events, if you're using some of these, you can avoid the toxicities and toxic reactions that we are getting in our foods, especially and maybe perhaps in the air some things that, were, that are very hard to avoid unless you're uh, extremely dedicated in your diet to avoiding them. And uh, most Americans just aren't. And most of the people you're going to be talking to aren't, so you have that problem. 
Alfalfa belongs in this group. Alfalfa is really, really good for inhibiting the absorption of a lot of uh, bad things. Like, and this is radiotherapy, for example. This is what comes to mind that uh, <clears throat> tissue damage due to radiotherapy can be dramatically reduced by the presence of alfalfa uh, constituents. The fiber in alfalfa works very much like that of pectin and bran, so you experience those benefits. And alfalfa can, under certain circumstances, can inhibit cholesterol regulation, or it can inhibit cholesterol absorption. We don't know exactly what's going on there yet, but the initial indications are along those lines. So if you use those particular substances, or if you recommend those to the people about you, you're probably going to have a substantial effect on the health of those individuals, uh, especially a combination of them. One or two of them used together might, might be a lot better than just one of them, or maybe all four or five of those particular things used daily in the diet could lead to a much better uh, health profile of the individuals. Um, and it's pretty bland research, you just, uh, but that's what it amounts to. That's kind of the deductions that we've been able to make from it. Any questions on that? Okay. But you said mentioned burdock root. Does that uh, have the same effect as alfalfa, basically? Uh, basically, except burdock has been implicated more exactly in preventing the absorption of food additives. Also, the uh, the white part under citrus fruits like grapefruit and oranges, and mm -hmm. that, that white part just under the skin is really good to tracker of heavy metals. Yeah, the uh, yeah, that's right. I guess you the bioflavonoids, the bioflavonoids. Right, the bioflavonoids in there are very good. The quercetin in particular the, as a flavonoid is a very good also in, in reducing the effects or reducing the absorption of these things. That's right. What did you call that? Quercetin? Quercetin. Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N. <clears throat> the, uh, major, well, the major flavonoids that I deal with are quercetin. Gluten and kaolin. Now there's a couple others, but I deal with those. All of those flavonoids have the ability to keep the body in a very clean, detoxified state, increase the uh, health of, of the immune system. Uh, they are good uh, free radical scavengers, uh, so they reduce the risk of cancer and then several other kinds of depilidating conditions. They're good to have in your diet, but you, what you'd want to do is just going out and buying them separately because there's some indications there that they may, in an individual state like that, they may also be toxic themselves to a certain degree. So what we normally do is you use a source, a good source, whole source of flavonoids such as silymarin. That's what? Uh, well, milk thistle extract. Oh. Okay. Um, that you saw in the seeds this morning you were chewing on. Uh, and then you supplement that and you combine that with some, uh, some quercetin or something like that, you see. And that is probably the best way to do it. To do what? To take these, to take the flavonoids. <coughs> with milk thistle. Yeah, with, yeah, a good source of wild flavonoids. Milk thistle is a good one. Is that available for the quercetin available for solar array also? Uh, it's available uh, yeah. in a lot of places. Yeah, a lot of places you can get this. This is very common sort of thing right now. Okay, well, now, shift gears a little bit here. Um, there's another approach you can use here, and this is kind of a folksy approach, and, uh, but I think it's important. It's not, there's science, science to be gleaned from this, if you will, and there's a lot of science to support this, but the actual practice is, is kind of folksy, and it involves the use of what I call the curry herbs. A lot of people <clears throat> do not know that that's not an herb. That curry is not an herb. Curry is a mixture of herbs, many different herbs. The list goes on and on. Let me see some. I always leave out a few. I talk about them to some extent in this book under turmeric. <coughs> that's, a, uh, that's a good curry. <coughs> uh, 
Um, but we have many of them. Did I list them here anywhere? Or not? Yes, here we go. We have coriander. Now, coriander is a curry herb which gives the curry, the Indian curry, that characteristic pukey taste, <laughs> if you will. I cannot tolerate coriander. I'm sorry. But there's there are just so many better tasting plants. Uh, but on the other hand, I know people who love coriander and would not consider using curry without it. But if you, if you eat Indian curry and you know, the kind of the little red and white can in the store, and you kind of go, this is awful, then, then that's probably the coriander you're tasting. Garlic. Now, we hear a lot about garlic. It's one of the best substances that there are. Uh, this morning, Ed was talking about substances that resemble DMSO. He left out garlic, whose, mo whose active molecules are almost identical to DMSO, and which, which transports through the system just almost exactly like DMSO does. Put it in, and a lot of people put it in their stockings, you know, against the ball of their feet. Within a little while, they're tasting it on their in their mouth. It's diffused through the system. It penetrates the tissues of the body very rapidly. It's an extremely good antiviral agent, and so forth. Garlic, one of the wonder drugs of the century, if you will. It's a curry herb. Cayenne, another great curry herb. Uh, it's what, uh, of course, makes a lot of curries too hot to taste. If you get curries from the uh, Thailand and Vietnam, these are extremely hot and uh, sometimes impossible to eat. Fennel. And fenugreek are both good curry herbs. They add a really nice uh, flavor a lot of times. The fennel gives it that, as you noticed out yesterday, the fennel has that licorice, anise taste to it. Now, the licorice, you know, licorice candy that tastes like, we say that's licorice, you know, that licorice doesn't taste like that. Anise tastes like that, and that's what gives licorice candy the licorice flavor is the anise. So fenugreek, anise, anise is a curry herb. Nutmeg is. Mace, cinnamon, cloves, black pepper, cardamom, ginger, and onion. These those are some of them. Now there is no such thing as the curry. Every country in which curry is a common spice has their own kind. And in some countries they have many kinds. They'll have one for their soups. They'll have another one for chicken, another one for beef. They'll have a separate one for uh, vegetables, generally speaking. They even have curries that they use in their desserts. And a good cook in these countries is the one who intuitively knows how to use these curries. And you see, it's, so it's become an art and a science in these countries. And why did it develop that way? Did it develop that way the way the milkshake developed in the United States? Is it? So somebody can make a buck off something that was sweet? No, that's not why they developed that way. The way they did, they developed the way they did because it was a natural evolutionary process. It was a pre way that these peoples used to prevent themselves from dying, from getting sick, from succumbing to the incredible variety of pathogenic organisms that exist in their environment. Um, we exist in a similar environment today, although most of our pathogenic organisms, if you will, are man-made. But we still have to contend with a lot of the natural environment, too. And so if you compare the different curries in the different areas of the country, in the different countries in which they occur, and you match up their antibiotic spectrum, and you notice that many of those that I read off are the same herbs that I read off yesterday have possessing antibiotic properties, you find that you have a pretty good profile of which organisms exist in which countries. Because they just naturally figured out through experience which herbs were going to be most effective in preventing the diseases of their environment. Now, they weren't always effective. I mean, they weren't always successful in uh, keeping down every single organism that came along, but they were successful in keeping their food from going rancid. They were successful in uh, preventing daily diseases and, and diseases that would eliminate great portions of the population overnight if they didn't work control. So it's worthwhile, I think, from a Western point of view, from a scientific point of view, to look at these plants and see what's in them that might contribute to those properties. And indeed, some of that research has been done. 
And the result of it is that we know four or five properties that almost every one of the curly herbs have in common. <clears throat> but before I tell you what those are, <laughs> you've got already made your list, and you'll have to <laughs> Before I tell you what those are, I just want to tell you this, that um, in terms of the diseases and so forth, uh, it doesn't harm anybody to keep a variety of the curry herbs on their table, the ones that they like. It doesn't hurt people to make up their own curry sauces and, I, and powders and so forth. And I highly encourage you to do that yourself and then to pass the word along and get other people doing it. I try to do that all the time. You get a lot of resistance. Hey, I don't have time to put a pizza in the oven, let alone how am I going to find the time to get involved with curry powders. But the people that do take the time are richly rewarded for it because it is fantastic. I forgot I was going to bring two or three of my own with me on this trip, and I left them there. Do you use them as seasonings? Is that yeah, I use them on seasonings on almost everything. Which ones do you like to use? Okay, well, I'm getting to that. Bon, just give me a chance here. Okay? <laughs> Before I tell you exactly which ones I use, I want to tell you that um, <laughs> that the idea is this. You go to the store and you purchase these. You go to the herb shop, you know, the health food store, and you can get, is this thing humming here? Yes. yes. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm worried about the recording. Oh, is that what you're, oh, good. Leave it the way it is. <laughs> Okay, um, well, turning the lights off does not help. <laughs> well, I don't know these switches. <laughs> is there a volume control on that? Well, let's see, let's see. Well, the volume control's on zero. Well, the volume control's on infinity. <laughs> okay, now, it still hums. Still hums. Which microphones are these here? Those are for the tape recorder. Oh, those are the tape recorder. Well, oh, they'll pick up everything. That's for the, the PA system right there. I, I'm probably getting some feedback through this. It doesn't sound bad. Yeah, no. I'm standing right under it. Oh, right there? Okay, well, I'll turn it up a little bit like that, maybe. That's better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good for the, good for the camera. <laughs> Just put it all the way down. so I can just talk for an hour without a subject. <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless, I still need to have some to know where I'm going. Are you going to tell us the herbs? That's great. You know, herbs. Herbs. All right, but I was going to ask you, how old was Lincoln when he gave, when he, you know, gave the Gettysburg Address? He was about 50, right? And I could do that when I was about 12. So I'm pretty, I'm in pretty good shape. Oh, yeah. Okay, now. <laughs> That's a <laughs> herbalist joke. Huh? Herbalist joke. <laughs> herbalist joke. <laughs> they said you were herbal, a good herbalist joke is, um, <laughs> you heard about the herbalists that got together and they were having this banquet and uh, and the people that gave them the watermelon had this watermelon out there but it was spiked with uh, vodka and the herbalist didn't know that. One guy went along and he knocked the watermelon off on the floor and on the Everybody was worried, but then they looked around and they saw all the herbalists were going around picking up the seeds. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how to grow that one, no? <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. Gotcha. Yeah, my anyway. Okay, so you go, you, you go to the store. I don't need this anymore. You go to the store and you purchase some. Um, all these curry herbs you can find, and some of them are hard to find. It's hard to find a good powdered fenugreek. So if you find it somewhere, you really get it because it's one of the best, I think, in terms of flavor. How do you spell it? Fenugreek? Fenugreek. Well, it's Greek to me. That's right. <laughs> Where do you buy fenugreek? Food store, health. Herbal effect. Herbal effect. <laughs> I should remember that. Herbal effect. It's common. 
Uh, Sounds like they have about everything you, you need. But a lot of health food stores will have a section of powdered herbs and whole herbs. And sometimes you can get little $30 seed grinders, Bosch seed grinders or whatever they're brown or whatever they make it. And then you can make it, you can grind it up yourself. Is that for See, a store? Is that what they say? I think it's a, uh, yeah, I think so. It's a, a wholesaler store made it. Anyway, the, um, so you need the herbs. And you need you know little quantities of them. You don't need a bunch of them, just a little quantity, a few ounces of each one of these. You need that, and you need the notebook. You take the notebook, and that's your recipe book. And you say, well, I'm going to use two parts of garlic and one part of each of these other ones. And you mix that together, and uh, then you try it on something. Uh, if you like chicken, you know, you make a batch of chicken, you try it on there. Um, you try it on a salad, just a tossed salad of some type. You try it there. Um, some, some pasta. Pastas are really good with, with uh, curry. <laughs> uh, and, and you spaghetti. just find out what you like, huh? Spaghetti, yes. Spaghetti meatballs. That's right. Spaghetti meatballs. You put it on there. Uh, there are a lot of places where you can use it. I, like I say, I use it on almost everything. Fish is great with the right curry on it. Soups with the right curries in them are terrific. You'll find out as you're doing that a few things. You'll find out that chicken, for example, responds to the presence of cayenne like, like no other herb. I mean, it just, you just bake your chicken just covered in cayenne. <laughs> and then you can bring it's it out. And if you don't like that much cayenne, you can scrape it off. <laughs> but, you, but it'll still leave a nice red covering on it. Eat the cayenne, throw the uh, fish away, right? <laughs> yeah, throw the fish away. <laughs> Uh, you'll find that in some of your uh, soups that if you're adding a little cinnamon nutmeg, some of these more volatile kinds of things that uh, they're, they're really beneficial there. Uh, get out recipe books from the Orient that talk about how to make curries and you'll find that each, each one will be different. If you want a really interesting exercise, go to the library, a library that has encyclopedias, and look up the word curry in the encyclopedias, I will guarantee you that none of them will say the same thing. <laughs> no. Some of them will say that coriander is the primary ingredient in curry. Other encyclopedias will omit coriander altogether. Why is that possible? Because they went to a different part of the world to get the definition of what curry is. And all these places have their own definitions. So when I make up my curries anyway, then I always have fenugreek, I mean, um, Turmeric is always very high on my list. I like turmeric. It, it gives a good flavor, even the sweet things. Rice. Rice uh, Rice is one of the best things you can try out curries on, by the way. Yeah. Don't they use turmeric to pickle cucumbers? Pickles? Could be. Yeah, they Yeah, there's the right. expert. Okay, turmeric is high up there. I have garlic high up there <coughs> and cayenne. If I can get substantial quantities of those three and anything I make, I feel happy about it. And then I round it off with fennel and then you need cumin. Sometimes I'll put cumin a little bit more if I feel in the mood for it because it has a really nice uh, feel and taste in the mouth. Okay, so you have all of these things, so big deal. You're now a curry expert. You know what to do with your curry sauces you have in your food and so forth. So what? Hmm? Well, pretty soon, <laughs> you'll start carrying the, these things around in your pocket. <laughs> Because you know wherever you go, if you're going to go out to eat, <laughs> you're going to want to have some of that on there. So sometimes somebody might even like they're eating a McDonald's burger or something. You really want to cover it with curry. <laughs> what the curries do, and almost all these herbs, these are the properties they have. First of all, they are anti-cholesterolemic. <laughs> Let's see if I can spell that. I think that's the word I want right there. If I'm not mistaken, that word means they prevent the absorption of cholesterol. So if you have these things in your diet, you're worried about the cholesterol levels in the foods you eat, put the curry on there. Eat your Big Mac you know, with a clear conscience. Drink your goat's milk. What's that? <laughs> so drink your goat's milk. Drink your ghost milk, okay. Uh, yes, drink your ghost milk, whatever you want there, you can do it. 
they, so they, uh, these countries that, that utilize the curries have very, very low serum cholesterol levels, and they don't worry about it a bit. It's not, it's not even a function of their, of their medicinal, medicinal arm uh, lingo. The other thing, another thing they are is they are anti, oops, let's not put anti, I <laughs> got you again. People that brought pens are in trouble. They are platelet aggregation in inhibitors. Platelet aggregation inhibitors. Plate, the platelets in the blood, and I'm sure mostly this is old hat for you, but they're the things that that uh, stick together and cause thrombosis. Uh, so if you can keep these, keep the stickiness of the blood down, if you will, then you prevent, it sort of thins the blood, that's a, one way of looking at it, and you reduce the probability of the occurrence of any significant thrombosis. Again, the countries that use curry have almost a zero incidence of thrombosis being a cause of death. Illness. <clears throat> Along those lines, they are fibrinolytic. Fibrin is the stuff that forms that uh, that clots the blood when you get a cut. Uh, again, sometimes the fibrinolytic system is a little out of whack. It runs too high for a zillion different reasons. This thing gets kicked into action and can contribute to. Uh, thick blood, blood that has a tendency to clot. And the uh, curry herbs, well there isn't one, essentially reduce that action from, from happening. Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, and finally, oh no, those were all in order. Let's see, finally they are, as I mentioned before, they are all antibiotic. Bacterial static. And so forth. That's all right, that's after the break stuff. Um, all right, now. They're not antiviral. Yeah, there's antiviral properties in these. Especially in garlic. I mean, garlic is extremely antiviral. Is it the oil? Anti huh? Is it the oil of the garlic? No, it's the allicin of the garlic. Allicin is that substance that is created when you slice the garlic and it creates the odor. And now I have to say this about garlic too, because I know there's some of you in here who use kaiolic garlic and other forms of deodorized garlics. Uh, it's my observation and based on the research that I have read, that the more the garlic is deodorized, the less effective it's going to be. And that if you want to have full-blown, you know, effectiveness in garlic, then you would use a straight, just pure garlic. What happens is this, you have a molecule, molecule in garlic uh, that's called alanin, a-L-L-I-I-N. Then you have an, another, you have an enzyme in there called alanase. And uh, these two items don't meet together very often. In fact, they don't ever come together in the uh, whole clove of garlic. And hence, if you pick up a whole clove of garlic and you smell it, you smell garlic. No, you don't. It's odorless. However, if you slice the garlic, you macerate it, you press it, whatever you do there, you, what you do is you release these, these two things from their uh, separate cages, if you will. They come together and the alanase works on the alanin and creates allicin. And the allicin, <laughs> what are we laughing at? The allicin is Some the, uh, huh? Some generation. Some generation. <laughs> the allicin is the stuff that is, um, that smells like garlic. And it's also the chemical that has most of the physiological activity. In particular, the anti-cholesterol properties and the antibacterial properties. 
So immediately when you do that, the allicin begins to dissipate and leave it. When you can smell it, that you're smelling the allicin leaving the garlic. It takes a long time for that to happen. Garlic that has been macerated can will smell for a long time after you've done that. Um, and so you can effectively grind garlic up and put it in a capsule if you want to and take it that way uh, and it will maintain some biological activity for months after you've done that. As long as it smells, it's active. If it has no odor at all, it's not active. So if you deodorize, what they do when there's two or three ways they deodorize um, garlic, but one of the main ways is, is they remove as much of this enzyme as they can. When they remove that, then there's not much left to convert that to this, but there is some there, and so even deodorized garlic smells. And, and uh, so it's going to be active. And so deodorized garlic may be the best compromise of social circumstances and, and, and uh, medicinal property, but uh, if you want the full effect, move to Eastern Europe and eat the whole garlic, don't worry about it anymore. <laughs> is it, all, is is it true all that garlic is, uh, how is it, body? How is it excreted? Is it through perspiration or...? Uh, yeah. Lots of different ways. It permeates the tissues of the body so thoroughly that it's, it's effectively eliminated uh, through perspiration, through the breath, through uh, the, in the stool, in the urine. It, it gets out in almost every way you can imagine. That's why it's socially... <laughs> That's why it's socially, yes, a, a stigma associated with it, but only among people who don't use it, obviously. That's right. <laughs> Convert your family, let the world go by. I mean, I, I mean, yesterday when uh, Ed was chomping down on the garlic, I knew if I was going to talk to him the rest of the day, I'd better get in the act. <laughs> that was that was baked garlic. That was baked garlic. I was going to ask you, uh, yeah, they figured out how does it actually break down the cell walls of the virus? And the, is it a physical? Uh, the, the oil is quite kind of a little costly. Like yeah, but, yeah. Is that what does the uh, virus side? Or? Um, garlic oil? oil, as a matter of fact, has been shown in some tests to not be a good bactericide at all. Huh. Now, and I don't know exactly why, but it just comes up as being, uh, as being non effective. So I can't answer that. I, it's been a while since I read any of the basic research on the bacteriostatic or the um, antibiotic property of garlic that I can't remember exactly what the cellular mechanism was there. But there was, there's so much report of contamination, pesticide contamination of garlic when you get it from the stores and they, they, they right. spray the hell out of it. Right, we'll just combine it with a few more curry herbs and forget about it. That's what I say. Oh, <laughs> spray the Allison out of them. That, well, that, that's, what I'm leading, that's what I'm leading up to in this presentation. It's just what I just said. Is that if you use these kinds of herbs liberally in your diet, you're not going to suffer the, uh, the effects of the environmental pollution to the extent that the people around you are going to suffer them anyway. You can dramatically reduce the ability of pesticides to survive, the ability of, of uh, other environmentally foreign toxins to enter the body in the first place, to get past the GI tract. What's going on back here? He says, then you're antisocial. <laughs> <laughs> right. who, who wants to be healthy, not have any friends, right? That's, <laughs> That's what garlic is, antibacterial, antibacterial antisocial. Anti yeah. yeah. Question, uh, is the powder then really that effective? Would it be better to use the fresh garlic? Well, I think the fresh garlic is the most effective. Right. But as I said, as long as there's a smell there, there is effectiveness there. And you yeah. just maybe have to use a little more of it than you normally would have to. But there's no doubt that the fresh garlic, fresh cloves garlic, is the most effective form of garlic. Any other thing you do to it begins to reduce its effectiveness. Oh, and you use that like when you cook and so on, you bet. It, it won't destroy the... It will begin to, yes. If you use it in your cooking and you actually cook it, yeah. then you know, like that baked garlic last night, you know, the, the odor that was really present there wasn't that great, was it? Actually, it was yesterday at noon, wasn't it? How many of you noticed on my breath yesterday garlic? Yesterday? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Oh, Sorry. Well, there was some there. I didn't particularly. Usually, I, I do. You did. Oh, that's too bad. I really noticed it on the edge. <laughs> he ate most of it. But, but, but yeah, the, uh, at any rate, there was a great deal less activity in that garlic than there is in most. They have vampire bats out here. Hey, if you think it was bad yesterday, you ought to try it today. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Okay, was there another question I saw? It's about 39. Ed, did you have a question? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. Okay, well, at least everything. 
a fit of nervous expectation or something. I didn't race at all. Yes. Are you going to be getting into uh, post-operative type of detoxification, in other words, where you would take heavy metals out of the cell? Well, that I, said, that I said is pretty hard to predict what the herb is going to do in that regard. There's virtually no research that has addressed that issue that I'm aware of. There's probably a lot out there that it does address that, but I'm just not aware of it. And as a matter of fact, chances are, within the next week, I'll go home and then I'll see it. <laughs> That's usually what happens. But uh, I, I really went through everything that I had trying to find something on that. I thought I probably had some, but I couldn't find it. Uh, it just, I don't know, it's just not there. What herbs are high in sulfur, for example? That's a finer for mercury, uh, besides garlic. Garlic is very high, but uh, onions maybe. But what other right, herbs are maybe? Two mints that are made high in sulfur. I need that book. The, the bioflavonoids, the uh, sulfur, the, the sulfur containing amino acids. Uh, yeah, that, those were all, all of those help get out of stuff. But the, the secret one is to have the uh, pectin or the ligands in the in the body so that the they can be re, the mercury can be absorbed well, in the intestines and expelled. Yes, I think if, if if that mechanism would work, if you could actually approach the cellular tissues through things that are passing through the gastrointestinal tract. Yeah, the, li the lignans, could they? You know, that's the question, and I don't know if that's been answered yet or not. Well, that's what they, that, that's what people look at saying that's how it's done. That's what's going on, though. Yeah. In the GI tract, it would happen, but yeah. With, uh, There's one thing that I'm finding, and that is during detoxification, if I'm using supplements that people start dumping heavy metals, that they start going through all their symptoms. And depending on how fast they're being dumped and how severe their reaction is towards the toxins depends on... Well, it, I would say if that is beginning to happen, then what they need to do is use uh, something like the pectin and kelp and keep it going in their system at all times because it will bind it up into an insoluble salt and it's not going to be able to react if it gets into the GI tract. However, if the things are working <coughs> intracellular, uh -huh. in, in the intracellular space or extracellular spaces or intracellularly, then then that's not going to have much of an much of an effect. But there shouldn't be anything going on because these uh, uh, these substances we're talking about usually do not create problems as they pass through tissues. They create problems as they accumulate and and kill and destroy and upset DNA processes and so forth. Because that's my understanding. Well, isn't there immunoglobin response? Uh, when yeah, it's but again, that takes time. That's not something that's going to happen. That, that doesn't happen just because they're passing through the tissues. That happens as the body begins to encapsulate and respond to them and build up an immune response to it. So it's an immune system gone out of control response, right? Uh, I don't know. Um, the use of um, herbs that will keep the lymphatic tissues moving uh, such as echinacea uh, would be indicated, I think, in a condition like that. To just open up these channels, keep them going, keep the, li the lymph and the dead tissues from accumulating in the lymph nodes and inflammation from occurring. Uh, I think that this would be a good approach to that also. But it's not one that I've ever looked at experimentally or know anybody else that's done that either. Uh, I'm just going to try to find something here. That's right. Stop bonds. Yeah. Stop bonds. Oh, hey. That's bonds. What's going on here, guys? No, that's the feedback. Three microphones. Oh, is that what's going on? You hear a hum? No, I don't hear a hum now. Because these guys. But I, I told you that, didn't I? Say some that's right. Feedback here somehow. There's the hums in now. Turn it off. Oh, oh. Well, let me turn it off. Just back off the input a little bit. Yeah, back off your input a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. When I'm standing here anyway, you can turn it down a little you're bit. No, 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 I'll donate it to the Academy of Biological <laughs> <laughs> You know, the difference between a dental convention and a dental funeral is? 
and then one less drunk. <laughs> he made that up after last night. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It occurred to me last night. I'm just waiting for an opportunity. Um, <laughs> hmm. The difference between LDS and LSD? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> I know, I just want to see it. <laughs> you just want to see the reaction, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, okay. You got it. All right, now. So, yeah, what are the ways then that, that uh, getting right down to brass tacks, that the curry herbs and the bran and the pectin and these, this whole range of things, and we might include in there um, that the mint family and the other volatile oils as being good detoxifiers, substances which promote things <coughs> happening in the body, cayenne and ginger which promote things going through the tissues, through the tissues and from one place to another in the body. You see that as these things are included in the diet, included in even as aromatherapy, just simply having 